announcements this morning. Um, for those of you who are taking attendance, um, the text slide uh, above will kind of tell you exactly what to text to 336-793-9317. Um, I have the pleasure and opportunity this morning to introduce our speaker, Dr. Michael Olivier. Um, he got his diploma, which is kind of like the master's equivalent um, in chemistry from the University of Cologne in Germany. Um, he got his PhD from Cornell in physiology and molecular genetics. Um, he's had numerous, numerous um, academic appointments, but we were uh, very fortunate to have him come in 2017 where he became a professor with tenure in internal medicine in the section of molecular medicine, and he is the director of the Center for Precision Medicine, and today he'll be speaking on obesity meets precision, precision medicine, new approaches to a growing problem. So at this time, we'll bring forth Dr. Olivier. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation to present some of my work. In thinking about what I should talk about, um, it turned out to be actually more complicated than I had anticipated. So for about 20 years, I've now worked on various aspects of obesity and the, both the research aspects, the basic science aspects, but also applied aspects, and how to tell this in, in a story that makes sense and seems reasonably lo logical and coherent is actually difficult. For those of you who do research, and probably also for those of you who don't do research but have heard of research, it never goes in a straight line. And I think if you're taking anything away from this story, it is exactly that. Research never goes in a straight line. There's always surprises and things never work out quite the way I or we as researchers want it. So, we actually all know what causes obesity, right? So this is not news. And we also know how not to become obese or how to fix it. It's all that green stuff and maybe some physical exercise. Um, there, for years, probably for decades, we've propagated a fairly simple and straightforward view of obesity and its complications. And that is that it's purely a balance of food intake and energy expenditure. And as long as you balance this or as long as you don't take as many calories in as you use, you're fine. And that's for the longest time what we have told people and what we have told patients, what I tell my family, what I tell myself. But things are not as simple in life as we make it work. And the reality of obesity is as I think we all acknowledge by now, far more complex. And that is that obesity has a lot of factors that contribute to it and has a lot of effects on our overall health that are important to consider because we often do not deal with just obesity. We de deal with obesity and its complications. So there's lots of potential causes. Um, there's genetics, dietary trends, the environment, socioeconomic status, physical activity or sedentary behavior, obviously. There's even things like the uterine development, the pre-birth development, and more recently, gut microbiome has gotten sort of the attention of how that contributes this. And as we develop obesity, we develop a whole range of what we call comorbidities or complications, right? So there's obviously insulin resistance and diabetes, there's polycystic ovarian disease, there's cardiovascular disease, cancer, sleep apnea, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, psychosocial problems. I by no means may make a claim that either the causes nor the effects are complete on this list. This just highlights that our simple view of just don't just eat less or use more calories is probably um, a oversimplified view. So my both personal and research interest has really been on this one key question. How do we actually gain weight and how do you lose it again, right? We have all these arguments of how not to gain weight, but chances are 90% of the patients that you see have already failed at that part to some degree. And their challenge is how do you lose it again, right? Not how do you never gain it in the first place, we all live in an environment where chances are we all should be obese. We have two TV channels that are dedicated 24 hours a day to show us how to cook things. There's 
supermarkets at every corner that sell us everything under the sun for 24 hours a day. So why aren't we all bursting at the seams? How do we balance this? And what are the factors that make this different for me versus other people in the room who obviously do not struggle as much as I do? So you've all seen various iterations of this. This is an image from the WHO. This is prevalence of adult obesity all over the world. Happy to report that the US is in the lead, or at least close to the lead. Uh, maybe not happy to report, I apologize. But this is obviously a worldwide problem. There are shifts on sort of the increasing rates of obesity in different countries, um, but virtually worldwide, the rate of obesity in adults is increasing. Now, the WHO classifies obesity and its different levels by a measure called the BMI, or body mass index. All of you are aware of this is basically a ratio of your weight and your height. Um, and then it classifies this into different categories. So there is the normal range is basically as long as you're under 25. And then as you increase these numbers, you become over classified as overweight, obese. And if you have a BMI of over 40, you're considered morbidly obese. What I want to point out here, and we'll come back to this question, is that the associated health risks, so the effects I showed you before, have different prevalences in different groups of these people. So if you're normal weight, your risk for the majority of these is relatively low. But if you deviate from this normal range, either if you go underweight or overweight, your risk changes and increases. This is an important concept because in 90% of cases, we've only looked at the aspect what happens when we go this way, right? When our weight get increases, what increases our risk? It actually goes both ways. So if you lower your weight too much, it has similar health consequences. So what does this look like? The WHO is happy to provide um, images for this. And I'm always fascinated that these images are sort of usually have long hair. Um, I will not go into any further of why these um, are more likely female images than male images, but as you can see, so these are the pictures of, for an individual that is five foot four, and for the weights that are listed down here, how we envision how these people look. So it should be pretty straightforward to identify people that are obese, right? So I thought I'd do a quiz with you. I'm, you don't need to yell out the numbers, but I thought it was interesting to show you something. So I picked a whole range of professional athletes, and I'll show you what their BMIs are. And keeping in mind how that picture was before, that anyone who's overweight or obese basically has a BMI of above 25, sort of looks a l little bit chubby. So we start with um, Tom Brady, quarterback, BMI of 27.4. So another football player, I picked them at random. I have no team preferences. Um, JJ Watt, defensive end, BMI of 34.3. Um, if football is not your thing, we can do basketball. LeBron James has a BMI of 26.6. Um, if hockey is your thing, Alex Ovechkin from, the Washington, from Washington has a BMI of 29.5. And just to sort of top this off, since I spent 12 years of my life in Milwaukee, Prince Fielder, one of the baseball stars in, on our team, a long time ago, has a BMI of 37.6. These are all professional athletes. So I think it's fair to say they actually ha are in good health and in fairly good shape. So it's obvious that BMI may not be the best way to sort of predict who gets comorbidities, because I do not know how many of these we would see in the clinic with fatty liver disease or insulin resistance or aspects like this. I'm not claiming that they will never have it. But BMI alone is obviously not a good predictor. And we'll come back to that, because 90% of the research we do in obesity is predicated on the classification using BMI. Whether that is clinically helpful medically helpful, um, we can discuss that at the end. So I want to touch on a couple of key questions that really have been my focus over the past 20 years. So the first one is actually, what's the best predictor of the health complications? So obviously, I have someone walk into the clinic or I see someone who has a particular BMI that I can measure, but that 
as I think I've sort of hinted at, doesn't predict these health outcomes particularly well, especially not on an individual patient basis. So are there better predictors for this? And then as a scientist, I'm obviously always interested in what causes this. What, are the, what causes obesity? But not just as a sort of esoteric basic science research question. How can we use that information in actually patient management? So if I know what causes it, is there any way how I can use that? What other key factors contribute to obesity and obesity rate health-related complications? What are the, can I look at a patient, remember I showed you 10 or so different causes, there's probably another list of 20 or 30 we could add to this, how do I e evaluate this? And then the holy grail, how do I actually make patients lose weight effectively? So there, every part that I will talk about in my talk today will sort of hit on some of these points. So the goal is really, how do I diagnose patients? And ideally, not how do I diagnose them once I can weigh them and measure them and it's obvious that they are obese. Can I diagnose patients that are at risk for developing obesity at an earlier stage before I can clinically measure this? Can I use that information or other information to actually predict health outcomes, to predict the effects or complications of obesity? Can I tell from some measurements who will likely develop diabetes, who will likely or with relative certainty progress to fatty liver disease? And then with that, no, with that knowledge, can I actually make treatment decisions on patients that aren't just sort of reactive, but can I potentially be proactive or preventative in some of these treatments? So as you heard, my PhD was in molecular genetics and in physiology, so obviously as a geneticist, we always think that genetics drives the whole thing. So, and it does, I'm not questioning this. So, so before anyone gets any ideas, no genetics does it. So for the initial years of my studies, I was fortunate enough to work with Dr. Ahmed Kiseba at the Medical College of Wisconsin and an organization called TOPS, or Take Off Pound Sensibly. This is a nonprofit weight loss organization. It's very similar to the Weight Watchers, except it doesn't sell meals and it's actually individual driven, but it follows the very similar concepts in that you have weekly weigh-ins, you have weekly support meeting groups. The difference is that weight targets or weight, goal, weight loss goals and the treatment plan is actually driven by your physician and you and not by an organization that wants to sell you um, dietary byproducts. So with Dr. Ahmed Kiseba has worked with TOPS, who is head, which is headquartered in Milwaukee, that's why this was convenient, at the medical college for decades and sort of studied members of TOPS and their families and measured all kinds of obesity-related traits in these families. So there's family studies, there's sort of unrelated individuals, there's sort of um, larger families. So once you find sort of a nuclear family, can you get all the relatives, cousins, uncles, and grandparents? And then we also more recently expanded this into studying children of these. So these were sort of cohorts where we try to understand the genetics and the basic science that drives disease in these particular families. And so the meta, this, the, the study started before I came to Milwaukee, so I cannot take credit or blame for this name. It's called the Metabolic Risk Complications of Obesity Studies. Um, for those of you who follow the genetics literature, we have a talent for coming up with really weird names for studies. So this is a family-based study without reminding you painfully of what you learned in genetics in college and or in your first year of medical school. In families, you can do something called linkage studies, which basically looks at what genetic portion is transmitted from affected parents to affected children, but not to unaffected children. And so it gives you a powerful way of trying to identify genetic regions in the genome that cause or contribute to the development of particular traits. And so we did this very effectively. These are cholesterol measurements. These are insulin and um, obesity-related measurements. This is a triglyceride measurement. So you get these nice curves. Um, 
And it's wherever these peaks are high, it indicates that those regions contain genes and mutations that are likely contributing to the development or to the variation in these traits in these families. We also did what's called genome-wide association studies. You may have see these, seen these types of Manhattan plots before. Without going into much of a detail, it's the same principle as up here. We list all the chromosomes down here, and when these dots sort of are above the red lines, as you would expect, then they must be important. So again, these then are genomic regions and variation that contributes to the risk genetically of the variation in this particular trait. What I'm showing you here is, again, an HDL-related measurement and a body fat distribution-related measurement. We, in this study, over sort of 10 or 15 years, identified numerous genes and variants in those genes that affect um, various aspects of the comorbidities and obesity itself. Um, very nice. We're obviously not the only ones who've done this over the years, so there is a large and never-ending literature on obesity genetics. Probably one of the first genome-wide association studies um, confirmed the identification of this gene called FD FTO um, as sort of a major driver in common obesity. Um, there were follow-up, so this was in 2007 and 2009, there were more detailed genome-wide association studies in ever more people, and more genes were identified. Again, this is a similar Manhattan plot. And again, the height of these peaks or these dots indicates of how big the genetic contribution of this particular, lo these loci are. You can see that FTO clearly is a major driver of obesity risk in these populations that were tested. Um, I would fail if I wasn't showing sort of a, a, the paper that one of my trainees from my lab eventually um, contributed to. This is probably the largest study in 2015. This was a GWAS study of over 300,000 people. It identified 97 loci or genes that contribute to the risk of increased BMI. The scary part in that paper is this statement. The 97 loci account for 2.7% of the BMI variation. So with all this effort, with 300,000 people, we're still explaining a teeny tiny bit of the variation in body mass index in this room. So in other words, if I were to look at these 97 loci and genotype every single person in this room, I could only explain 2.7% of the difference between us in the measure of BMI. Not really a very useful clinical predictor or an actionable clinical predictor. I, I shouldn't say not useful because it certainly helps us understand biology, but it's not actual, actionable for any of you who see patients in the clinic because what do you do with that risk, right? 2.7%, is that really relevant? Well, maybe this is a problem of BMI, right? So maybe we're just measuring the wrong thing. So several years ago, we published, or this was in 2018, we published a study to look at more detailed measures with imaging of body fat distribution. And you can find loci, this, there's actually people here that were involved in it. Um, various studies were brought together, all who had done body imaging and quantifying fat depots throughout the body. I'm only showing you two. These, again, are these infamous Manhattan plots. Now, on the top is for visceral adipose tissue mass, and you can see there is a few dots sort of that come close to that line. This is a picture of pericardial adipose tissue. There is a couple of these loci. Now, I don't expect you to remember where these peaks and these dots were in the previous plots that I've shown you, but believe me if I tell you that not a single one of these overlaps with these similar plots if we do this for BMI. So clearly the genetic drive and the underlying biology determining where fat and how much fat deposits in particular locations in our body, whether around the heart or in the visceral adipose tissue or subcutaneous adipose tissue, are not the same physiological and biological drivers that determine overall measures like BMI or waist circumference or any of the other, or waist to hip ratio, all of these 
anthropomorphic measures that we have defined over the years. So here's the state of obesity genetics. Um, we have identified numerous genetic loci and genes and mutations that contribute to obesity. Um, it's obviously that different measures of adiposity um, and obesity are associated with different genes. Um, it's probably not something we were willing to admit, even though probably every endocrinologist, every physiologist could have told us this beforehand, that um, visceral adipose tissue and the factors that lead to a hypertrophy or a grow, an expansion of those fat depots are probably different factors than what determines our height or our overall weight. The, known, the challenge of this remains is that the known genes explain only a small fraction, fraction of the variance in obesity. So as a geneticist, that leaves me with a couple of painful questions, right? So how do we identify the rest? And the rest is an understatement because if you assume that about 50% of, of our variation in obesity-related traits is determined by genetics, we've barely scratched the surface with explaining 3% of that. How does this help to under, us to understand the underlying physiology? So we're finding all these genes. We don't quite know how they're regulated, or in, often, in many cases, we don't even know what they really do and what they do in relation to adipose tissue biology or overall adiposity. And the more pressing question, even though I'm not a clinician, remains in my mind is how do we use this information to actually help patients? So I wish I could now sort of spend the next 20 minutes and tell you all the brilliant things we've done that solve all these problems, and I can tell you how to do this. All I can do is I can show you a few snippets and a few vignettes of stories of where we've tried to gain more information in these, to address these questions. And hopefully, as we work, continue to work, and maybe with input from people in this room that have similar interests, maybe we can advance and figure out so how we actually can use this information moving forward to drive treatment, decision and, treatment decisions and patient management more effectively. So the first thing I want to talk about is a study that um, was done here in collaboration with Dr. Kylie Kavanaugh in pathology, Dr. Laura Cox here in internal medicine, and Dr. Biswa Misra also in internal medicine. This is what we call a multi-omics study. So I think I've convinced you, as much as it pains me, that genetics alone isn't going to do it. No matter how many people we look at, no matter how many genes and mutations we look at, genetics alone is probably broadly speaking, not giving us the actionable information that you as a physician would want. So maybe looking at other molecules that drive biology, proteins, how genes are actually transcribed, metabolites that float in our body that may act as signaling or, or functional molecules, maybe profiling all of these will give us a better comprehensive view of what actually happens in our cells and in our organs. So the model we're using here is a model that Dr. Kavanaugh developed here at the collection campus. She took vervet monkeys and fed half of them for six weeks on a high fructose diet. Six weeks of high fructose diet overall, if you sort of follow the literature, has no overt phenotypic changes. So these animals aren't all of a sudden exploding or gaining weight like crazy or sort of are twice as big, six weeks of this diet is a relatively short-term exposure. So what we wanted to know, does this short-term exposure in the liver, which is the primary organ where all the lipid and carbohydrate metabolism should sort of combine as a first task, are there changes in the liver that sort of are different even in these six weeks? So in other words, are we triggering more comprehensive responses and is there biology there that is new or that isn't visible with just one of these traditional approaches. So we did RNA-seq, which is a method to sort of look at what genes are acti actively expressed in this tissue. We looked at all the proteins and all the metabolites and a lot of lipids that we sort of could quantify. This, I should say, can never be comprehensive, right? We're, we're trying to do 
a sort of broad enough screen, but we're not testing every lipid, every sugar that circulates in your liver. So here are the data. And I thought rather than giving you numbers, I show you some nice pictures. So what you see here is the five animals on chow diet and the five animals on fructose diet. This is RNA transcript. So these are genes that are expressed. And you can see for a number of these, there's clear group differences between the um, sort of chow fat animals and the high fructose fat animals. It's, there's, um, this is, I'm only showing you the statistically significantly different genes. If you looked at a lot of them, they would be identical across the board. If you do this for the proteome, you can still see these differences. There's fewer of them. As you can see, there's not as many lines, so there's not as many different proteins that are significantly different between the groups, but there are some. In metabolites, the same holds true, although the picture becomes a little more fuzzy because you just, we don't profile that many metabolites. So in total, we find about 220 transcripts, close to 100 proteins, and uh, two dozen metabolites that are significantly different in the livers from animals that are fed a high fructose diet for just um, six weeks. Now, how do you make sense of this, right? I mean, it's nice to have these lists, but um, it's not any more helpful than knowing 50, 97 genes or gene names that are contributing to obesity. So we as Biologists and physiologists, we do these fancy things that we look for networks and pathways that these genes may, cha may share, right? So if you do this for the transcript data, so if you look for the 220 transcripts and you try to find which ones of these have some relationship, so there are genes that one drives the expression of the other one, or there are um, co-molecules in a receptor, or there are signaling molecule plus a receptor, or anything along those lines, you can see you get sort of a picture like this. There's a few connections. It's obviously not all 220 genes that were in the list, so obviously there is biology we're missing. So if you look at the proteome, since there's fewer proteins, the picture doesn't look quite as nice. And if you were to try this with the 25 metabolites that we did, you don't really find any connections. There's too few molecules. Now, this is what we have traditionally and historically done. This is how we want to understand biology, right? We infer this, and we think this actually drives biology. Now, the striking thing is, if I take all these data and throw them together and ask, what does it tell me about biology, it actually gives you a picture like this. Now, I will not dwell on the, on the details of these nodes, but I think for anyone in the room, even if you know nothing about proteins, nothing about gene transcription, it's very obvious that the integrated analysis reveals much more of the underlying relationships in biology than any one of the data sets alone. Um, so what you can then do is you can find sort of these fancy networks of how genes, proteins, and metabolites sort of are related to each other or are correlated to each other and have shared potential shared biological functions. Without interpreting this too much, what's depicted here, the red um, symbols are proteins, the blue ones are metabolites, and the green are transcripts. And you can see, again, in this integrated view, you're all of a sudden finding correlations between molecules that any one of these data sets, particularly if you tried this just with the metabolites, would never have uncovered. Now, I wish I could tell you, told, tell you that with this six-week study, we have resolved of what fructose does in the liver, and from here on out, um, we will never use high fructose corn syrup in anything anymore. Again, biology is not as straightforward, so I wish we were there yet. But I think what this shows, I hope you take away from this, that maybe with a more comprehensive view of what actually happens on an organ level, we can gain additional information to actually understand how different animals or different humans process fructose differently and what the potential health consequences of that may be. So I want to switch to a second vignette. This is work that I did when I was at the Medical College of Wisconsin with a colleague, a hepatologist there, Dr. Samer Gauri. Samer has since moved to um, Indiana University. Um, I couldn't convince him to come to first Texas and then here with me. Um, Samer is very interested in fatty liver disease. And we were particularly interested in trying to explore whether we can use molecular means to not only characterize the differences between patients that have just fatty liver or that have NASH, 
we were much more interested in seeing whether we can avoid one of the major complications in diagnosing patients with NASH. So let me, for those of you who are not hepatologists, although I'm pretty certain the majority of you in the room know more, know more about liver than I do, this is sort of a simplified picture of what a normal liver looks when you do a cross-section and what a fatty liver looks. Um, this is sort of a basic depiction, about 50% or more than 50% of people that are clinically classified as obese will develop steatosis in the liver, and a significant percentage of those in their lifetime will progress to non-alcoholic alcoholic steatohepatitis, which includes both um, changes in um, hepatocyte biology, but also inflammation and fibrosis. Now, we can have discussions about these percentages sort of on an annual basis. I think they get adjusted depending on who wins. But the bottom line that this is a complicated picture. Just because someone is obese, I cannot predict whether they will have steatosis or not. And I cannot pick out patients that have steatosis who is most likely to develop NASH and fibrosis. Now, the way historically or traditionally hepatologists do this is with these little things. So they take a long needle, they poke in your liver, and the pathologist will look at it and score it. Now, without dinging any particular profession, um, the interpathologist correlation in evaluating NASH status or NASH scores is poor, to say the least. Um, this process has a 10% risk of bleeding. It's painful, and it's only indicated if liver function measures, ALT, ASTs, and other parameters are perturbed. So we're never doing this to a normal person to sort of see whether they're on that trajectory. So we're only getting them once the liver is already damaged. So obviously, this is not the best way of diagnosing patients early. So when Samer started the study, we wanted to know, are there earlier molecular indicators that we can use to identify these people early? and ideally without a long needle like this. So he collected over 150 individuals. I think in the end we had about 225 individuals that were undergoing bariatric surgery. They all had a BMI of over 40. Um, of these, based on the pathology evaluation of a liver biopsy, 46 had no liver pathology and no steatosis. Um, fi about 15% had full-blown NASH based on clinical criteria and all the others were sort of had steatosis to varying degrees and maybe some early inflammation, but did not have fibrosis. From every single one of these patients, we collected a fresh liver biopsy sample because it's relatively non-invasive to actually take this. You don't need to take a needle. You can actually do this during the laparoscopic surgery. Um, we collected blood samples and serum and plasma to do all kinds of measurements and do a detailed pathological evaluation to exclude all other liver pathologies and assess liver function and did lipid profiling on it. So one of the first things we did, since I'm a geneticist and I'm a molecular biologist, we do gene expression analysis, right? So I've shown you this type of picture before. Here's a list of people that are classified pathologically normal and people that have um, various degrees of either fatty liver disease or NASH. And you can see that there's clusters. Um, these are, again, statistically significantly different between the groups. We can find transcripts in the liver that are clearly different between these people. Now, as a geneticist, I can use this information and actually try to identify genetic sequence differences in the DNA sequence between these people that are likely driving these differences in gene expression. We call these EQTLs, or expression QTLs, quantitative trait loci. So these are sequence changes in your DNA that affect of how much or how little of a particular transcript you make. So when we take all of these and look whether there's evidence for any of these EQTLs, we come up with a whole list. This is just showing you this for two traits. So this is the NASH score. It's an activity score, a composite score of how pathology, how it's been recommended to develop NASH scores. This is just sort of looking at the gradation of the severity, whether you only have simple steatosis or actually NASH. And you can see there's a whole bunch of them. So our hope when we started this study was, okay, now we have all these liver-specific, genetically-driven factors that contribute to NASH. Can I take instead a blood sample and look at blood cells and find any of these 
changed in a similar manner and in the future can use that diagnostically. So, right, I take a blood sample, I do this, and I know whether the person is, has the gene expression profile of a NASH patient without actually having to poke them with a needle. The frustrating thing is not a single one of these worked. So I'm not claiming that this is universal. We've used blood gene expression measurements a surrogate for a wide range of diseases. So I'm trying to define this as narrow as possible, but not a single one of the loci on this list that were clearly genetically driven expression differences in the liver related to NASH bore out in doing gene expression profiling in um, blood samples and peripheral lymphocytes. So this clearly, uh, I know this is a negative story, because it basically shows that our idea of taking this molecular and genetic information into diagnosis, uh, diagnostics didn't work. But I think, again, it highlights the need for understanding what happens in the liver and how it translates into what happens in other tissues and how can I use that information to predictively diagnose patients. So overall genetic somic summary, I think I've shown you a, at least an impressive picture that omics approach can provide additional information to genetics and genomics approaches. It discovers novel biology and pathways and physiology. Um, but I think it's also fair that the clinical user application at this point is still complicated. I wish there was a simple answer. So I'll show you another snippet. This is work that Dr. Laura Cox and Dr. Peter Nathaniel started several years, long, Peter Nathaniel started decades ago. So he, Peter is interested in fetal maternal health and the interactions during early fetal development and the long-term health consequences of this. This, the, this whole field of study was initiated when researchers in Europe um, sort of studied individuals and their offspring that survived the Great Famine during World War II in the Netherlands. So several large Dutch cities in 1944 and 1945 in that winter were completely shut off from any um, surrounding country food or supply. And as a consequence, the population really starved. It was, had a very high mortality rate. But the people that survived, um, as you can imagine, these were the large cities of Amsterdam and Rotterdam and others, there were numerous people that were sort of caught in this, women that were pregnant during this time. There was actually a surprisingly large percentage of women that were able to carry babies and they were born. And so about in the 1960s, investigators in the Netherlands started to follow up on how these children from mothers that were that were born during this famine, how they were doing health-wise. There were striking discoveries. Indivi women, children that were born to women that were pregnant in their third trimester during this famine had a 30% higher rate of diabetes. Women that were pregnant during the first trimester in this period had a, the children in adulthood had a significantly higher obesity rate and a threefold higher risk of cardiovascular disease. There's numerous other aspects that they have shown differences in, but it's clear that different stages of fetal development and maternal nutrition clearly influence long-term health outcomes in the offspring, not just birth weight, which is what we traditionally think of. So Peter has developed this model of using a baboon where he either feeds the mothers before pregnancy and during pregnancy a high fat, high cholesterol, high carbohydrate diet to make them obese, or he feeds the mothers during pregnancy a 30% caloric reduction diet, <coughs> which makes the offspring what we call intrauterine growth restricted. Um, and so it, the very first part he did, he sort of used these and looked at what actually happens to the fetus. So here are images. This is um, an indication that fetuses in mothers that are growth restricted actually handle glycogen in the liver completely differently. 
they accumulate more glycogen than a normal fetus would. Now, if you take these animals, and when they're born, and you sort of follow them, he sort of thought, well, is this metabolic abnormality or this abnormality of how I handle sugars maintained, or does, does it sort of balance out? Once I put them on a chow diet, they'll all be fine. This is a seven-week diet challenge with a high-fructose, high-fat diet. And as you can see, these IUGR offspring animals behave different no matter what you look at. The weight gain, the fructose consumption, the body weight, all of these parameters change. Animals or offspring born to mothers that are suboptimally nourished have long-term consequences of how they handle food and diet and energy intake. They also have compli um, complications in other organs. These are data, I think, for seven-year-old, when these animals were seven years old. Um, I'm not going into sort of the details of the imaging. This is basically functional measures of heart ejection fraction and sort of normal heart contraction and function. As it turns out, these IUGR animals, these offspring from growth restricted, um, nutritionally restricted mothers, behave like older animals. They seem to be aging quicker. Their hearts aren't functioning the way, their hearts are functioning like animals that are at least twice their actual real age. So something happens in this that dramatically alters their metabolism. Now the same is actually true um, in mothers that are obese. These are images from, again, control fetuses. This is near term um, looking at livers. This is a normal fetus. This is a fetus born to a, or from a mother that's obese. There is dramatic increase in fat accumulation, in steatosis in the liver before the animal is actually born, in the fetus already. So obese mothers already deliver offspring that already has a metabolically abnormal liver and challenged liver. You can also see this in gene expression profiles. So again, this is sort of the patterns I've shown you a couple of times. There's a large number of genes that are changed in expression compared to control animals in these livers. This is liver tissue only. The same is actually true for a lot of other metabolically active tissues. There's abnormalities in adipose tissue. There's abnormalities in skeletal muscle tissue. There is likely abnormalities. We're still working on this in sort of brain tissues. These animals, whether they're the mother is overnourished or undernourished during pregnancy has dramatic health complications. So both maternal obesity or undernutrition during pregnancy dramatically changes, leads to metabolic abnormalities in a variety of tissues. Um, IUGR offspring show accelerated aging cardiac phenotypes. They also respond differently to dietary challenges. So this comes back to there's lots of factors that we have no idea how they do, but they influence how we gain weight, how we lose weight as human beings. How many of you as clinicians, when you see a patient in their 40s or 50s and they're obese, have asked um, whether their mother was obese during pregnancy? You don't, right? You maybe ask whether other family members are obese, but you never really question what happened during fetal development. So we're clearly not touching on all the biology that affects to this. So about five years ago, Tony Camusi and I, when we were both in San Antonio, were struggling with this fact that we're actually not collecting enough of this information and we're not building enough broad-based clinical resources to understand what patients do. So we decided to start a project called the TOPS Genome Registry. Um, again, I told you we're geneticists, we come up with fancy abbreviations. This is genetics and epidemiology of nutrition, obesity, metabolism, and exercise. You have to come up with a cool name. The idea of this is can we randomly profile and get information on, pe on people, on TOPS members, general, the general population, and ask them questions about their nutritional behaviors, their health status, and all kinds of things, and build a resource of patients where we have information that we can go back in and now ask specific questions. For example, could I identify 
50 women in North Carolina that are obese and have been obese since high school and do a taste preference test on them, whether they like chocolate or not. Well, if you wanted to do this in the clinic, it would take you a long time to sort of recruit them. Here's a resource where you can actually browse them and ask them, are there people, right? Can I identify 50 women in North Carolina in their 50s who were already obese in high school? Do I want to study whether people that do not eat breakfast lose weight more effectively than not? So there's all kinds of questions you can ask with a resource like this. So again, I've told you what TOPS is. We initiated with TOPS and advertised this to the members. The benefit of working with TOPS is that every TOPS member reports annually their weight back to headquarters. So the headquarters maintain a record, an annual weight record for every member. So here's a couple of examples. This lady started with a BMI of 54 and then relatively quickly was able to lose about 50% of her starting weight and keep it up. Now, I don't know how many of you can read the scale at the bottom, but from here to here is 40 years. This lady has managed the miracle of actually keeping off a weight loss of way more than 10%, which is normally when we're really happy, right, if someone maintains a weight loss of 10%, and keep it off. Now, obviously not every TOPS member does this, but these women, predominantly women, are surprisingly successful in this. So again, this lady lost a significant amount of weight and then sort of juggled more, but was able to keep it off. Now, not everybody does this. There's also TOPS members that follow the exact same support group regimen, do the weigh-ins, do the discussions, have the same overall support system, but they gain weight <coughs> over years. Again, given the difference in genetics and physiology, it's not surprising. What is surprising is that we're having an intervention, again, that works in some people, as probably any of you who's talked to patients about weight loss has encountered. It works in some, it never works in all. So we're hoping to build, to continue to build this resource to sort of see how can we actually study this. So far, we have about 600 participants in here. We have questionnaires and saliva samples for DNA analysis. We've begun some initial analysis. There's some interesting biases in early repositories like this. So for example, if you at the moment analyze the about 500 individuals where we have complete questionnaire responses, it seems that the best predictor of who is successful in weight loss or never gaining weight is actually eating chocolate. Um, I'm not advocating this as a treatment option yet. Maybe we will get there. Um, so the, obviously the numbers need to get much larger. We have begun to look at <coughs> um, DNA sequencing to ask the question, these, like this woman that actually managed to lose 50% of her weight and keep it off, what is unique about this woman? Or women like her when I compare them to women that start with the same beginning weight but don't manage to gain weight, right? Is there low-hanging fruits? Remember, I'm still a geneticist at heart, so the first question is, is there a genetic predisposition? We are expanding this study in this summer. Um, TOPS has an annual national convention where all the over 2,000 or 3,000 of their TOPS members convene. Um, we will collect virtually samples from anyone who's willing to talk to us there. Anyone in the room who's interested, you've probably walked around campus and there's flyers for this everywhere. This is not restricted to TOPS members. Anyone can participate. The idea is the broader this resource is, the more we can start asking questions. Are there subgroups of patients that are worth studying more and testing particular interventions in? So I've shown you some snippets on this diagram. I've shown you more than your share, more than you ever wanted to know about genetics of obesity. Um, there's clearly dietary trends and habits. We've, I've talked some about the uterine development studies that we're doing here, and I've shown you some of the outcomes. There's much, much more to do. And I think the goal of this is really that we want to come to a way of that what I highlighted before, right? Can we diagnose patients effectively using this knowledge can we diagnose them before the clinical symptoms manifest? Can we predict their health trajectories? 
Can I study an 18-year-old and not only know what their likelihood of or their trajectory is with regards to obesity, but can I predict their risk for fatty liver disease, diabetes, any other health complication? And can we use, ultimately use this information to more effectively both do um, treatments, but also potentially preventative treatments that could I give an 18-year-old statins from the get-go for the rest of their lives? We have never done this. We are sort of reactive at the moment with a lot of this because we simply don't have the information. So I hope I leave you with that promise of precision medicine. I'd be happy to discuss that in more detail. Um, obviously, I shouldn't stop without thanking of all the people that actually have made this work. Obviously, I didn't do any of this work. People from current and past and present members of my lab have done an exceptional job. I'm indebted to TOPS for working with us, the Top Center for Obesity and Metabolic Research at the Med Medical College of Wisconsin, where all the initial genetics work was done, members of the genetics department at Texas Biomed, where I was before I came here, and now centers, uh, members of the Center for Precision Medicine. Obviously, a village alone doesn't help. We've been fortunate that NIH has been willing to support a lot of our efforts. And with that, I'll end, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Are there any, anyone have any questions? Way back there. <laughs> I'll meet you halfway. Um, thank you for a great talk, just largely over my head, but very interesting. Um, you talked a lot about, uh, obviously, genetics, maybe round up to a 3% variation in BMI, so on and so forth, uh, the metabolism and gene expression. What I didn't hear, and maybe I missed it, was epigenetics, because it seems to me, just as a clinician, that there's a switch that gets flicked, yeah. and that it can even last over generations. Has anybody looked at, maybe not our genes are the really, really important part, but what are we doing to our genes? That study in utero, the famine, is a famous epigenetic study of we're actually modifying our genome as far as a gene... Uh, transcription, methylation that can be passed on to generations, are we doing that by modifying our dietary environment and other things like that? Maybe that's where the uh, one of the answers are. Yes. So the short answer to this is I only presented some of the snippets. A lot of the integrated analysis, a lot of the uterine development studies involve epigenetic studies. We're looking at the epigenome, just the same thing. I would claim, though, that based on data that exists at the moment, epigenetics alone is similar to genetics or proteomics or any one of the platforms not going to tell you the whole story either. Um, I think it will require the integration of this information, but there's absolutely no doubt you're right. The epigenetic influences of dietary intake, intake of lifestyle, of exposure to heaven knows what, whether it's pre-birth or post-birth will have a significant impact on how we process some of this. How it actually works, um, I wish I could tell you we had an idea. I think we have a beginning idea of how this works, but in most cases we can pick up the differences in the epigenome, but what the functional consequences of this are and how they're both treatable and preventable is really, really complicated. So, you know, Michael, it, it seems this fantastic talk. I mean, it seems like one of the biggest issues in obesity research is actually, you know, the phenotype. So, you know, BMI, as you showed, is, you know, not very you know, reliable. So I'm wondering where is uh, kind of the state of the art with regard to sort of understanding the phenotype of obesity, you know, that might be most predictive of adverse events you know, when you start to get at some different phenotypes, you know, are the genetics, you know, more helpful and more explanatory? So, the, what the best phenotype or phenotypes are, it's probably not one measure, um, is an almost religious debate. Um, it depends on whether you ask, talk to imaging people or to endocrinologists or to other parameters. I think it's fair to say we will not, there will not be one magic measurement that will 
um, be perfectly correlated. Um, to your second part, are these, call, let's call them sub-phenotypes or detailed phenotypes, are there any better genetically? In some cases they are, but as I showed you with the body fat distribution, we're actually finding fewer genes and not as strong genetic signals as I would have expected. Um, so I think, again, it's a reflection of the complex biology that underlies this. We have no way of doing a measurement that is directly related and closely correlated to obesity that is driven only by one or two or three genes and therefore would have a major effect. We're dealing with something that's extremely polygenic, has lots of other influencing factors. So as a consequence, I think we need to do detailed profiling of a lot of different sub-aspects of this disease. And it will probably take the power actually in a lot of these analyses, as I showed you in this woman, comes from looking longitudinally about behaviors or responses to challenges or diet. I don't think a cross-sectional one-time measurement will ever allow you to predict what's the best um, path for one of your patients of how to lose weight. On that happy note, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, that was...